hello friends, thank you for joining our study. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk, so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. Our next section, Do Non-Baha'is Go to Heaven? So our first quote um, is from Abdu'l-Baha in the Propagation of Our Universal Peace. But when I consider this calamity in another respect, I am consoled by the realization that the worlds of God are infinite, that though they were deprived of this existence, they have other opportunities in the life beyond. Even as Christ has said, in my Father's house are many mansions. They were called away from the temporary and transferred to the eternal. They abandoned this material existence and entered the portals of the spiritual world. Forgoing the pleasures and comforts of the earthly, they now partake of a joy and happiness far more abiding and real, for they have hastened to the kingdom of God. The mercy of God is infinite, and it is our duty to remember these departed souls in our prayers and supplications, that they may draw nearer and nearer to the source itself. This analogy expresses the relation of the temporal world to the life hereafter. The transition of the soul of man from darkness and uncertainty to the light and reality of the eternal kingdom. At first it is very difficult to welcome death, but after attaining its new condition the soul is grateful, for it has been released from the bondage of the limited to enjoy the liberties of the unlimited. It has been freed from a world of sorrow, grief, and trials, to live in a world of unending bliss and joy. The phenomenal and physical have been abandoned in order that it may attain the opportunities of the ideal and spiritual. Therefore, the souls of those who have passed away from earth and completed their span of mortal pilgrimage in the titanic disaster have hastened to a world superior to this. They have soared away from these conditions of darkness and dim vision into the realm of light. These are the only considerations which can comfort and console those whom they have left behind. In the quote, we're told, one, the worlds of God are infinite. That individuals who are deprived in this existence have other opportunities in the life beyond. And that the mercy of God is infinite. And that a soul, this is actually about the Titanic, as we see, the, uh, the sinking of the Titanic, but the soul has been freed from a world of sorrow, grief, and trials to live in another world of bliss and joy. Now, I would propose uh, for Baha'i and non-Baha'i friends who might be listening, it is impossible that the Master here is claiming that every individual on the Titanic in this grievous disaster was a believer. It's impossible. It is impossible that, first of all, that he's claiming that they're all Baha'is. That is utterly impossible. Or that they're all Christians, or Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists, uh, that they were all believers. But he's saying that these individuals have moved from a realm of confinement and constriction, and to understand that such souls have actually been released from the cage of this body. Because God's grace is infinite. Now they weren't allow, able to make, uh, if you will, a perfect life, but they will have opportunities in their life beyond. What those opportunities are, we shall soon see. The challenge here is because it sounds as if these individuals, some of whom we have to assume, have not recognized the manifestation of God, are not necessarily fulfilling their, if you will, their the purpose of their existence. Uh, given the, the definitions of heaven and hell, how could this be? But oftentimes heaven is used, I would propose, in reference to the next world. 
the world after this, the afterlife, the great beyond. The other times it's often used, and oftentimes the term paradise is used in such cases, that is actually expressing the state or condition within our being. In a sense, we all go to paradise, we all go to heaven, but we don't all go to paradise. So can we make up for lost opportunities? I think we've already seen one instance where we're told that. Uh, this is from Shoghi Effendi. He feels that many of the perplexities that arise in your mind could be dissipated if you always conceived of the teachings as one great whole with many facets. Truth may, in covering different subjects, appear to be contradictory, and yet it is all one if you carry the thought through to the end. For instance, the statement on life after death and the condition of believers and non-believers you might say that a wonderful believer is like a diamond blazing in the sun, an unawakened soul like one in a dark room. But we must couple this concept with the other part of the teachings, that God's mercy exceeds his justice, and that soul can progress in the world beyond. The unillumined soul can become brilliant. There is a principle here in this passage that actually is, I almost think, universally relevant in our study of the Baha'i Faith as well as our study of the Baha'i Faith and its relationship, say, to Buddhism or Christianity or Islam or Judaism. Because he says, truth may, in covering different subjects, appear to be contradictory. And yet it is all one if you carry the thought through to the end. It doesn't mean, you know, truth can appear to be contradictory, so don't worry about it. <laughs> it's actually saying, that we should be carrying this through to the end and really, like, really exploring it. And he then gives this example of the afterlife. Um, and he says that a wonderful believer is like a diamond, the one brother on the street, uh, like a blazing in the sun, an un unawakened soul, is like one in a dark room. Um, they're both diamonds. One blazing like the sun, one in a dark room, a mirror facing the sun, or in the same position and flipping and reflecting nothing. Um, they both have the same capacity. And then he says that the soul can progress in the world, the unillumined soul can become brilliant. Okay? Unillumined soul can become brilliant. And there are many divergent realities and concepts related to the great beyond, generally. And Really, we have to be, if you will, take these differing positions that we find within our own writings and others and try to carry them through to create a picture. That's why at the beginning I called this a conversation starter. And at this point, we know that there is a heaven, there is a hell, there is a judgment. And at the same time, it seems that those who have not become illumined can do in the next world. It is even possible that the conditions of those who have died in sin and unbelief may become changed. That is to say, they may become the object of pardon through the bounty of God, not through His justice. For bounty is giving without desert, and justice is giving what is deserved. As we have power to pray for these souls here, so likewise we shall possess the same power in the other world, which is the kingdom of God. Are not all the people in that world the creatures of God? Therefore in that world also they can make progress. As here they can receive light by their supplication, there also they can plead for forgiveness and receive light through entreaties and supplications. Thus as souls in this world through the help of the supplications, the entreaties, and the prayers of the Holy Ones, can acquire development, so it is the same after death. Through their own prayers and supplications, they can also progress, more especially when they are the object of the intercession of the Holy Manifestations. So once again we see that he says that those who have died in sin and unbelief may become changed. That in that world they can also make progress, both quotes from the actual text. They can actually do so by to plead for forgiveness, receive light through their supplications, and that souls in the help in this world 
uh, through the help of such entreaties and prayers, can develop so as that the same after death. So that, in, in essence, individuals who have missed the ability to find the Beloved and to begin to shine like a diamond, uh, having been left in a darkened room, have the ability, the possibility, to actually progress in the next world. This first quote is from Shoghi Effendi. In accepting Baha'u'llah, you have accepted Christ in his appearance as the Father, as he himself so clearly foretold. The Catholic Church does not believe this. On the contrary, it still awaits the return of Christ. If you decide, in order to be buried next to your dear husband, to return to the Church, you either would have to, in good faith, deny Baha'u'llah, or you would be just using the Church as a means to satisfy desire of your own, which would certainly not be an upright and conscientious thing to do. When you think that your husband's soul is now free of the limitations of this world, and that he no doubt is beginning to see religious truth in its true light, and to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah, you should ask yourself whether he would wish you to leave the truth for this day, and re-enter the church just for the sake of your dust being near his dust. Your spirit, when you pass away, will be near his spirit. Of what importance, then, is the body? He will pray for your guidance in this matter. In this passage, the context is that a Baha'i, who was formerly a Catholic, is asking the guardian if it was okay for her to actually um, be buried in the sacraments of the Catholic Church, because they would not allow her to be buried there. And he says that, quote, and that he no doubt is beginning to see religious truth in its true light, and to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah. That's the, the, the heart of the quote I want to look at, because this individual himself because um, he's telling the, the guardian is telling this woman that she cannot, in good faith, proclaim certain beliefs that she doesn't actually believe, to follow certain rites that she shouldn't be following if she herself is not a genuine Catholic. That this is, would be ingenuine. And in this context here, he's saying to her, "Well, your your husband is fully is beginning to see again uh, religious truth in his true light, and to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah, beginning to." Uh, and is beginning to see religious truth and appreciate the station of Allah, which means in that world he does not know. When he entered this world, the unveiling of religious truth begins, which includes the station of Baha'u'llah, but it does not mean, or it means that the husband does not immediately know. Often we have a conception within uh, religious communities that it's like, well, if I have a friend of mine and, you know, say I'm a Christian, and this individual is not, that, well, when he dies, he'll know I was right. Uh, I've heard this said uh, in the context of Baha'i <laughs> discussions as well, uh, and Muslim uh, discussions as well. But according to the writings, this individual is coming to appreciate the station of Baha'u'llah, Baha, meaning he did not know. In essence, he did not know that Baha'u'llah was a manifestation of God. This next passage is actually passages within passage, uh, because the, uh, they'll be quoting uh, the Guardian, for example, or Abdul Baha, but the letter itself is from the Universal House of Justice in response to a believer. We'll begin. With reference to Baha'u'llah's tablet in which he says that all the relatives of believers will reach the kingdom in the other world, by this is meant only a partial attainment. They can, however, progress indefinitely, as spiritual progress in the other world is limitless and is not confined to those who have attained unto the knowledge and recognition of the cause while still in this world. For example, the following extract from a letter dated March 17, 1940, written on behalf of the guardian to a believer whose father had recently passed away, provides the following statement. The guardian wishes me to hasten to convey to you the expression of his deepest sympathy 
in this grievous loss which you have come to sustain. He will specially and earnestly pray for his departed soul, that in the realms of the spirit beyond it may receive such guidance as would enable it to fully recognize and accept the faith, and thereby attain abiding peace and happiness. Shoghi Effendi, in a letter dated May 22, 1935, written on his behalf to an individual believer, makes the following statement. Concerning your question whether a soul can receive knowledge of the truth in the world beyond, such a knowledge is surely possible, and it is a sign of the loving mercy of the Almighty. We can, through our prayers, help every soul to gradually attain this high station even if it has failed to reach it in this world. The progress of the soul does not come to an end with death. It rather starts along a new line. It is possible for a soul not only to recognize the truth in the next world, but also to make up for lost opportunities. Shoghi Effendi, in the following letters written on his behalf to individual believers, states, no man can obtain everlasting life, in the full sense of the term, except through acknowledging the manifestation of God in this age, Baha'u'llah. If he doesn't do it in this world, he will have a chance to progress in the next one. He will pray that the Beloved may sustain and comfort you in your great sorrow, and that also he may, in his unfailing and all-merciful love, Bless the soul of your departed husband and enable it to grow and advance spiritually and attain unto the full recognition of his revelation. Now that the veil has been lifted and that his soul has been liberated from the material limitations of this contingent world, may he be guided to a truer and deeper appreciation of this cause and make up for his lost opportunities while he was still in this world. The quote is actually, it starts with the quote from Shoghi Effendi, and it, where he says that the relatives achieve a partial attainment, but that the progress in the spiritual world is limitless and is not confined to those who have attained unto the knowledge and recognition of the cause while still in this world. So an individual who has not recognized the cause, not known of it in this world, may have an opportunity to do so in the future. The second quote again, on behalf of the Guardian, he says that in the realms of the spirit beyond it may receive such guidance as would enable it to fully recognize and accept the faith. We know that such a knowledge is possible, they actually quote him as saying, even if it has failed to reach it in this world. The progress of the soul does not come to an end in death, all quotes. It is possible for a soul not only to recognize the truth in the next world, but also to make up for lost opportunities. Again, quoting, he will have a chance to progress in the next one. Or, it will enable it to go and advance spiritually and attain under the full recognition of his revelation. May he be guided to a truer and deeper appreciation of this cause, appreciation of this cause, and make up for lost opportunities while he was still in this world. It's a very beautiful picture uh, for these individuals having the ability to actually make up for lost opportunities, to recognize the cause, to recognize the manifestation. But all of this is predicated on the fact that they have not. They don't know. These individuals, in each of the cases, if you go through it, are individuals that have passed on. They have gone to the great beyond. And they themselves, in the great beyond, do not know this cause was true. They do not know the manifestation of God was Baha'u'llah. These individuals, it says, it is may receive such guidance. Such knowledge is surely possible. It is possible for a soul to recognize truth in the next world. Possible for them to make up for lost opportunities. We'll have a chance to progress. If you listen to the quotes I already quoted in each case, um, it's that you can have a full, you can come to a full recognition of the revelation and oh, may he be guided. May he be guided to a truer and deeper appreciation of the cause, and if so, make up for lost opportunities. So the idea that a beloved one who does not agree with you um, 
that when they pass on, they, in that reckoning, if you remember all the way from the beginning, in that judgment, they suddenly will somehow see that they're wrong, and that the errors they have made in the life, in this life, but at the same time, don't actually know that they rejected a true manifestation of God. They do not know that, that the revelation of God is the revelation of God. This idea that individuals do not know the manifestation of God for their time period, uh, once they enter the next world, if we really think about the definitions and what we know of heaven and hell, should actually be obvious once we begin to consider it. Um, we live in a state of hell or a state of heaven. Those being defined repeatedly as first, if you know the opening of the Most Holy Book, <laughs> the recognition of the manifestation of God, and then following His commandments and His good pleasure. Carrying out the if you will, the physician's remedy for this world, being a part of reconstructing society in the vision of the manifestation of God for that day. So if I am in this world, and I am in heaven, or paradise, to make it clear, where do I go? Paradise, when I pass on. Because I move from a state of knowing the manifestation of God in this period into a state of knowing the manifestation of God in this day. Well, of course, then, the, the individual who is actually in hell in this world, thereby defined as reunion, as, if you will, sorry, the lack of reunion with the manifestation of God, the lack of the knowledge of the very purpose, the teleology, the telos of that individual, and not acting, right? Again, the second condition, the opening of the Most Holy Book, and not fulfilling that which is for the best and greatest good of humankind in this day, moves from that position of hell, a lack of knowledge, and working with that knowledge to embody his teachings, to a place in the next world of a lack of knowledge and not embodying his teachings. <laughs> we move from paradise to paradise, from fire to fire. We don't move from paradise to fire, or from fire to paradise. So if we suddenly knew what the God's cause was in the next world, and appreciated the station of Baha'u'llah, as he tells this uh, um, uh, formerly Catholic wife that he doesn't, um, then we would actually move from a lack of knowledge and a lack of embodiment and following his teachings, and at our death would immediately know that that individual was a manifestation of God, and thus would enter paradise. But that's not what we're told. It's, he it's hell to hell, paradise to paradise. Um, the following two Quick quotes are uh, written on behalf of the Guardian. November 15th, 1940. Dear Mr. Vakil, Your letter of the second instant has just reached our beloved Guardian, and he indeed feels most profoundly grieved of the news of the passing away of your elder brother in Nasvari on the 14th of October last. He wishes me to hasten in conveying to you and relatives heartfelt condolences on this truly heavy loss you have so cruelly sustained, and specially to assure you of his special prayers on behalf of the deceased, that in the realms beyond he may be guided to the recognition and acceptance of the cause, and thereby progress and advance spiritually. May the Beloved deal mercifully with his soul, and enable it to attain to highest spiritual destiny. And may he also protect his bereaved family, and impart abiding solace to their sorrow-laden hearts." So at the end of the section we see that once again, that in the realms beyond he may be guided to a recognition and acceptance of the cause, and thereby progress and advance spiritually. And the second quote, that in the realms beyond, she may have the joy of recognizing Baha'u'llah. In each of these cases, the guardian is dictating his wishes that he will say prayers that the past, the loved ones who have passed on, the loved ones of these Baha'is, may have the opportunity to be 
guided to the recognition of this cause and understand the station of Baha'u'llah, a theme we will uh, delve into more shortly. There's a the next section I call the Endless Worlds of God. The simple question is, how many are there? This first quote comes from Baha'u'llah. You may be sure his ardent prayers will be offered for the success of your Baha'i work, and he will also pray for your father and for the soul of your dear mother, that in this world beyond she may have the joy of recognizing Baha'u'llah. Um, so this very quick quote states what? That the creation of God embraces worlds besides this world and creatures apart from his creatures. Um, and there are things ordained in some of these worlds that we could never even contemplate. And I think this, well, my son may take this to mean worlds in our, say, example, our multiverse or extended universe. Uh, there are things that cannot be contemplated, and we will see in the next quote that we're discussing spiritual worlds. Verily I say, the creation of God embraces worlds besides this world, and creatures apart from these creatures. In each of these worlds he hath ordained things which none can search except himself, the all-searching, the all-wise. So here he says there are worlds holy and spiritually glorious that will be unveiled to our eyes. And, it's, and in here he talks about his sustaining grace. He says, and to obtain a portion of their sustaining grace, to get the benefits of these worlds, their joys and their sustaining grace. And the question is, and we'll return to it, what is the sustaining grace in those other worlds of God, really endless worlds of God, that we're supposed to actually derive? O oh, my servants, sorrow not if, in these days and on this earthly plane, things contrary to your wishes have been ordained and manifested by God. For days of blissful joy, of heavenly delight, are assuredly in store for you. Worlds, holy and spiritually glorious, will be unveiled to your eyes. You are destined by him, in this world and hereafter, to partake of their benefits, to share in their joys, and to obtain a portion of their sustaining grace. To each and every one of them you will, no doubt, attain. So the worlds are countless in number and infinite in range. So according to Baha'u'llah, the cosmos is countless vertically, countless worlds, and each infinite within its range, or infinite basically horizontally and vertically. And yet, Abdu'l Baha says the following. As to thy question concerning the worlds of God, know thou of a truth that the worlds of God are countless in their number and infinite in their range. None can reckon or comprehend them except God, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Uh, in this passage, he actually said at the same time, says there is one world. But this is actually, if we actually look, it says that the creation of God, the first quote we looked at, the creation of God embraceth worlds besides this world. So in one sense, there is one world, one creation, with infinite worlds, or countless worlds, infinite in range, within them. And we've looked at this theme previously um, as to where are heaven and hell, but also where are the worlds of God. Um, the following quote is from abdu -Bah. O thou seeker after truth, the world of the kingdom is one world. The only difference is that spring returneth over and over again, and setteth up a great new commotion throughout all created things. So once more we see this theme of uh, stacked kingdoms within the world we inhabit as a representation, an analogy for an understanding of the many worlds of God. Here we have the example, once again, of the mineral, a stone. And on top of a stone is growing some moss, or you know what I mean, and a little plant. And on that plant is an insect, and a frog is eating that insect, right? And a cat's chasing the frog. We actually have 
all these different, if you will, cascading even degrees within kingdoms, right? The moss and the flower, the insect, the frog and the cat. And we see that they're all interacting and I myself could be a biologist studying the feeding habits of this frog. All of these worlds and kingdoms, if you will, can actually coexist at once. And he gives them examples of kingdoms. He gives the, he actually speaks of them as worlds, states of being and states of relative existence that we can occupy. But that in each of these, the ability to truly discern fully the reality of the kingdom above us is cut off. There's a block. We're unable to do so. I remember seeing once it was a it was a picture of uh, actually a marine biologist, right? Uh, literally bending down to actually touch a whale. And there was a fish in the background, jumping, and on the back of the whale there was like a barnacle. And it was fascinating to me because I could see in this one picture all these different kingdoms actually uh, interacting at once. All existing. Many of them living, but how different the nature of the livingness, if you will, or the state of being that they are occupying. 